Hi guys, it's Teresa. Welcome back to my channel. Hmm, I hadn't planned on doing this video and I almost don't want to do it because it kind of makes this whole thing more real. But as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, Today I'm going to be talking about Muse of Nightmares by Lainey Taylor and unfortunately it's not really going to be a positive video. If you've been on my channel for a while, you might have seen my Strange to Dreamer video which I uploaded uh, two years ago when Strange to Dreamer first came out and I gave it a glorious review. I absolutely adored it. It was a 5 out of 5 stars for me. I love the story. I love the writing. It was magical and whimsical and beautiful and I just adored everything about it. And I have held off on reading this one, not out of any sort of trepidation that I might not enjoy it, but just because I didn't really feel like reading it. Um, but just a few days ago, I actually reread Strange to Dreamer and gave it 5 stars again and felt like it was finally time to finish off this duology. Unfortunately, it did not go as well as I had thought it would. If you don't know, Strange Dreamer is about a boy called Laszlo who grows up as an orphan in a abbey with monks and uh, one day he discovers the library and becomes a librarian um, in this town and ever since he was a young child he's been obsessed with the mysteries of the lost city of Weep. The stories surrounding Weep are very obscure and long forgotten almost nobody else besides him really cares about them but it was a city that traded with theirs um, for a long long time until about two centuries ago when all contact with them broke off um, all of a sudden and since then they haven't heard from it so he's just so intrigued and obsessed with it and he devotes all his time to researching Weep until one day a delegation from Weep arrives in their town asking for scientists and other experts that could possibly help them a mysterious problem that they have. I don't want to say more than that in case you haven't read the book yet I don't want to spoil it for you but that also means that I'm very limited in what I can say about this book as far as the story goes so I thought I would split it in two parts and at first I'm going to talk exclusively in non-spoilery terms for those of you who haven't read either the first or the second book and then I'm going to dive into some real talk because that's really why I'm here I need to vent I need to get this out there because otherwise I feel like ah, it's just gonna fester in me and it's not gonna be a good time. So in terms of how this book relates to the first one, it picks up right where the first one left off and the story continues pretty much seamlessly. I will say at the beginning, there's a lot of repetition of what already happened at the end of the first one, which I think serves to kind of bring readers back that took a break of like a year waiting for this to be published, which does make sense. But reading them back to back, it was really frustrating almost because I was like, I've, I've read these exact same sentences. Like it's not even like, oh, the, it was described, but no, I felt like entire scenes were just copy pasted back into this book and it was sort of weird like I've, what I've already read this why is this happening again and then also after the events of the first book you kind of feel like something should be happening right at the beginning of this book like it's the biggest cliffhanger ever and you definitely feel this sense of like urgency but genuinely for the first like 50% of this book nothing happens absolutely nothing they do nothing the plot is zero like it's so strange and it doesn't work at all and to me it felt so out of place considering what just had happened and like knowing where all these other characters were at that the main characters were just doing nothing for so long like waffling around genuinely it was very frustrating and i did not understand their motivations at all but genuinely the biggest thing that really made this book feel weird to me while reading it is that it feels like a completely different story than the first one when we start strange to dreamer we're very sure who this story is about it's about laszlo it's about his discovery of weep discovering his own place in the world discovering his own worth to the world and it's a great story i loved it i was very involved i was very invested and then we turn to book two and it seems like he's not the point of the story anymore like he's there sure and he does things but it feels like the story was hijacked by other characters that either didn't even exist in the first book or like we didn't hear of them in the first book 
or didn't seem that important to begin with. And now this is suddenly their story because somehow Laszlo has already like fulfilled his purpose somehow. And now he's just like there doing random stuff in the background, but he's not the main focus. And that felt jarring, genuinely. When I read a book, I wanted to either have limited scope or a very large scope, but I want that to be established at the beginning. I want to know at the beginning what I'm getting myself into. And in this book, I felt like it was limited scope at the beginning. And then in the second book, it is just the whole universe all of a sudden. That's what it's about. It's about the whole universe. And it just didn't match. It didn't go well together. I was very confused. I felt distanced from all the characters that I was following in the first book and that I cared about in the first book because now all of a sudden all these other random mysteries of the universe have cropped into the foreground even though I don't actually care about any of them because so far they haven't really been an issue yet. Again, this might just be me, but to me that just felt so strange and out of place. That kind of just leads to this book not feeling like just one story, but kind of like many stories thrown together and now all of a sudden you're supposed to care about all these individual strands and it's not really helped by the fact that all of these individual story threads have a lot of backstory crammed into them because it kind of just feels inauthentic especially since they were not a thing in the first book all of a sudden you have this new story thread these new characters that you've never heard of before and you're supposed to care about them because now all of a sudden you're told that they're important somehow. And it just doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It just makes me less interested in all of them, to be honest, instead of making me more interested in these new characters as well. Another thing that really annoyed me in this book and that kind of made me realize a fundamental fact that I believe to be true is that not every evil character needs to have a tragic backstory that sort of justifies their evil behavior. And that was unfortunately the case for literally every single one of the characters that was behaving not in a good way. Everybody is redeemed. Everybody is given this way out, sort of. Nobody really has to pay for their actions because once you're told their backstory, there's, that's very tragic and steeped in suffering. All of a sudden, you're like forced to have empathy for them, even though that again feels out of place and not organic. I love a good villain that has a backstory that sort of explains their behavior, but not necessarily justifies it or tries to make excuses. And that wasn't what happened here. Every single evil character was given redemption, was given a way out of their evil ways, was told, no, you don't have to be this way. We can save you from your own past. And then it just happened and it felt extremely unsatisfying. I can handle that if it's like a singular event, if there's like a group of characters that are considered to be villains and then one of them is like redeemed through some way. I totally like that. I would like that. But not every single one, not every single one needs to be a tragic hero in their own story while appearing as a villain to others. That's not necessary. In fact, it is unwanted in this particular case. The problem is also that this book and this world has like no stakes. And in most other books, you have certain states that you don't want your characters to be in. <laughs> That's very cryptic, I know. But for example, you don't want them to die. Like that is always a thing lurking in the back of your mind. Like, oh, they're in dangerous situations. Death is probably the worst and most permanent thing that could happen to them. That is what needs to be avoided all, at all costs. And that fear of death raises the stakes. And that fear of death makes it exciting. So when in a book like this, you take all those stakes and you just rip them out and make them a non-issue what is there to be worried about literally there's nothing to be worried about and the last thing i want to say in the non-spoilery section is that there's definitely too much romance in this book and i hardly ever say that because i like a good romance story i like it like sweet cute romance stories set to the backdrop of a war story or like some other fantasy story i like that but in this book it was it was nauseating is probably the best way I want to put it. Like there were still some cute scenes and some endearing scenes, but at the end of the day, 
it was too much. It was way too much. Everything was of such import. Like every little touch and kiss and look like set off fireworks in their characters' brains and they like went crazy with lust and love, which I'm pretty sure these people don't know how to tell those two things apart. And uh, so far they've been pretty bad at that, at telling them apart because so far all I've seen is lust. <laughs> but they're all like, oh my God, I love you. You don't. That you don't not yet okay you don't but anyway while i can kind of buy that type of like overwhelming attraction when two characters first meet and this is literally like their first some semi-sexual encounter and they're going crazy with hormones like i can buy that but once they have done that a few times I find it very, very hard to believe that they're literally almost imploding just at the other person's touch or look or a word of tenderness. Like, I don't care. And if anybody looks at anybody else with witch light burning in their eyes one more time, I don't know what I'll do, but it won't be pretty. All that to say, as much as I love Lady Tales writing and as much as I love almost like exclusively reading her romance scenes because she writes them so beautifully and there's so much feeling there. And I felt that especially in the first book, it really fit um, the situation because it was sort of a tragic love story. It was um, sort of fleeting and vulnerable and in danger all the time. It felt really fitting for that. But where that romance goes in the second book, it is it is almost like a distortion of how it was in the first. It feels like a mockery of what it was in the first book. The moments that were sweet and beautiful and poetic just became cheesy and nauseating and too sugary sweet to even take, kind of. And compounded with all the other things that I didn't like about this book and just the fact that they spend so much time making out and not enough time actually pursuing the proper plot or pursuing the goals and like recognizing that they're in danger and that they need to do things other than constantly make out it just turned into kind of a shit show and i hate to say that because i really wanted to love this book but i just couldn't i couldn't there were times i really enjoyed it but overall i was just kind of trudging through trying to make it end i think if you really want to know all the mysteries of weep and all the other elements that are introduced in the first book this book does have those answers for you it almost has too many answers if that makes sense like it's almost too like this is this and this is that and like we need to we need to know everything about everybody here like we don't really read this book. I mean, it, it does have the answers. But other than that, I don't know if this is really necessary. I almost feel like Strange to Dreamer itself should have been a standalone, which it can't because it doesn't have a proper conclusion. As I said, it kind of ends on a cliffhanger. But still, I feel like, I feel like you could just not read this and you'd be fine. As, as sad as I am to have to say that. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about some spoilers. So if you have not read this book or Stranger Dreamer, you better click out now. Please come back very soon for another video. I'd love to have you there and thank you and bye. Okay. <laughs> I think if you have read the book, the you will have gleaned from what I've just said that the biggest issue I almost have with this book or one of the bigger ones is that death means nothing, absolutely nothing. And as soon as that happens, you erase the stakes, nothing matters. Literally being a ghost is exactly like being alive, except you can't die and you can only feel things that you've already experienced. Those are very limited limitations, okay? This is pretty much, this is almost better than being alive, right? I feel like it would almost be best to just live your life and try as many things as possible and then like kill yourself and be a ghost for the rest of it because it's so much better. <laughs> You are a corporeal if you want to, you are incorporeal if you want to. You can uh, apparently still use your gift and, uh, you know, continue to have dream sex with your um, somewhat boyfriend. You can literally do anything you want <laughs> as a ghost, almost. It's, it's truly tragic. I thought at least there would be some 
some sort of downside to it, it there doesn't seem to be one. They haven't even had ever a conversation of like, will we ever want to have children? I don't think ghosts can carry children. Maybe that's another limitation. But like, what are you going to do about that? Like if at least they had somewhat discussed that because apparently they're already like, planning their whole future together. I don't even know. Not that necessarily they need to want to have children, but I'm just saying like, I want there to be some constraints and it seems like there isn't anything. It's so unsatisfying. <laughs> I thought they would at least like manage to give her a new body, right? Like her being a ghost would suck and they couldn't do all the things that they would want to do. And then eventually she would find a new body and they finally could because that is an arc. <laughs> What this book had is not an arc. It's not anything. Literally, the first 50% of this book is one extended makeout scene between Laszlo and Sarai, and there's absolutely nothing else happening, pretty much. Really. I feel like, I think about at 50% is when they decide to go down and get Errol Faye. Like, that's sad. <laughs> They are making out for so long and there's no stakes in it because in the first book you were excited. It was like only reserved to when you were sleeping. There were limitations to that. They were excited to finally meet each other in person. Like there was something to look forward to. And this book was just like 250 pages of almost having sex, but not really because no apparent reason because self-control again for no apparent reason it was just weird it just felt really weird and dragged out for no reason <sighs> what is the point what is the point of any of it and the same with errol fane's death his death is the most inconsequential ever he was one of the most tragic characters of this duology and the most conflicted and the worst off to be perfectly honest like i feel like he suffered the most almost out of everyone and I didn't need him to be saved, but it would have been totally fine for him to die, actually, to be dead and remain dead. Like, why do we need to bring all these people back to life? It makes everything seem pointless. And I don't understand how authors have not yet grasped that because it, it is so obvious to me. <laughs> if you make death the only thing that's inevitable and permanent in life mean shit, then why, what, what is the story you're even telling? Like, why, why would I even care? Nothing matters if you can't die. That's the fact, unfortunately. And as I said, I really did not like or need all that backstory on Korra and Nova. They are so immaterial. I did not need to read all those chapters. It would have been totally fine for them to like enter this bubble Laszlo and those people and like Cor and Nova came out and then they realized her backstory. That would have been enough. I didn't need to read all those chapters. It genuinely felt like Lainey Taylor didn't know what the world looked like in the first book and just in the second book on a whim decided to throw together a bunch of stuff and then randomly connected to her daughter's Smoke and Bone series, which I actually kind of liked that um, element for some reason. I don't know why, because I usually don't like such blatant crossover, especially when it says, it's part of another story. This is another story that I've already written. <laughs> but I kind of liked it. It was like, oh, Chimera and Angels. That does ring a bell somehow. Um, so I think that's kind of cool that there's some sort of overlap. It's not really there, but they exist at least in the same universe. So that's cool. But other than that, like, was there a point? Was there a point to them there being so many worlds? Like, I almost honestly wish that it was left to the imagination, like where the angels came from. I didn't need that all sp spelled out. I didn't need to know. I didn't even care to read it. I was like, oh, okay, hmm. moving on. But yeah, I think this video has gone on for too long. I've already ranted and rambled to my heart's content and I, I'm glad you stuck through it. Thank you very much. Let me know in the comments, mark it as spoiler if you're gonna post spoilers or you can also DM me on Instagram as always. Um, but let me know what you thought of this book because so far I haven't really heard many people's opinions. A few have um, messaged me on Instagram, which I really appreciate. But other than that, I don't know many people's opinions. So let me know in the comments, let me know on Instagram, and uh, we can chat some more about it. And while you're down there, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe. I upload every Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday, and hope to see you very soon with another video. Until then, have a lovely week. Bye.